Hello, I'm Mary McClone of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet speaking to you from Carondelet. And this is the first of a series that we're going to be putting on the internet about our history. Today, we're talking about the mission of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Lyon to America. All of this today is going to be about the communities founded from Lyon and Carondelet. Later, we'll have other series or other presentations about the communities founded from Bourg and Le Puy and other US congregations. Today's part is going to be limited to the communities that were founded by about 1850, with a second presentation coming later that will take us up to 1860, which is a really key date, because in 1860, the congregations of St. Joseph began to decide whether or not they wanted to organize themselves as a US or an American congregation. After 1860, everything was different in terms of their foundations. So let's see where we started. We'll go to this next slide. And what we're going to figure out is that our origins had to do with a really fortuitous, actually you could say providential confluence of events. There was a great missionary fervor in France after the French Revolution. And that was, that was true of other parts of Europe, too. But France seemed to have kind of a special uh, take on it. Here we see the name, the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. This started with a woman who you probably have not heard of, who is now the blessed Pauline Jaricot. Born in 1799, so the revolution is well into full swing by then and lived until 1862. Pauline was a young woman whose brother was a seminarian. And he wrote to her about the adventures of the missionaries in America. And so Pauline got really moved by what she heard and began to th try to collect money for those missionaries. She belonged to a card club, and so she figured that if she and her friends who met each week to play cards, or each two weeks, each contributed a penny apiece, and then each member of their card group would go to another card group and have all of them collect a penny apiece, and little by little, sort of chain letter effect, she began to get some significant contributions for the missions in America. Well, at first she was looked on pretty askance by some of the priests and church officials because he was a laywoman doing something that they hadn't thought of yet. But as it got really successful, they sort of took it over, invited her to let them use her idea, and it became called the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. So that's where it all started with this young woman, Pauline. Uh, and she really got the ball rolling in terms of missionary contributions for the world beyond Europe. The other person in this uh, unique coming together of things was the Countess Roche Jacqueline. Now this is a younger picture of her than we're used to seeing. But the Countess was two times a widow. She was childless. She had known the, res the revolution from the vantage point of the Catholic nobility in France. The Countess was a pious woman who had a truly missionary heart. So now we'll take a look at the France that they lived in. Our next slide here shows us France. Now this is a contemporary vision of France, but we get an idea of where we are and the distances that are implied. Down here, we have Le Puy with the yellow arrow. Le Puy is 82 miles from Lyon. Uh, this other arrow here points to Saint Etienne, where Mother Saint John Fontaine began the new community after the revolution. So Saint Etienne, Le Puy, Lyon. Uh, from Le Puy to Monistrol, 
where Mother St. John first was in community, was a mere 28 miles. From Le Puy to saint Etienne is 48 miles. So that gives us an idea. Oh, the other thing we need to see is the distance to the port that the sisters used. They went out of the port of Le Havre, which was 400 miles from Lyon. And Amtrak wasn't working in those days. So on our next slide, we'll see a little bit more of uh, what was coming together in this unique way, this providential way. Bishop Louis William Valentine du Berg. Bishop well, lived from 1766 to 1833. He was a member of the Sulpician community, a Frenchman, who started his career in the United States as the president of Georgetown College in Washington. He knew and entertained George Washington. He was the founder of St. Mary's College in 1791. Uh, apparently, he was a very good PR person, but not such an excellent uh, financial administrator. Um, he became appointed the apostolic administrator of Louisiana in 1815. Now, that's a rather large diocese, if you notice. Uh, when he was appointed administrator of this area that came into US territory as the Louisiana Purchase, he went to Rome and began to recruit uh, clerical help, as in priests. One of the first people that he recruited was named Joseph Rosati. Uh, and he brought him to the United States to be his assistant coadjutor. Now we'll see, here's our picture of our friend Bishop Rosati. Giuseppe, as he would have called himself, Joseph, as he's known in our history. Rosati was not long in the United States before Bishop de Berg returned to France and went ahead and resigned his see while he was there, leaving Rosati in charge of things. Now, they had made the center, the, at the bishop's see of that Louisiana Purchase in St. Louis because there were some real conflicts and problems in New Orleans. So, Bishop Rosati became connected with the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. Uh, after a number of different appointments, he became named Bishop of St. Louis in 1827. St. Louis was separated from New Orleans or the Louisiana Diocese. At the time that he became Bishop, uh, there, were other, there were sisters working in the Diocese of St. Louis, which was rather large. It did extend to the west, to the foot of the Rockies, and to the north. Uh, well, they weren't exactly sure where the border was between the Diocese of St. Louis and the Diocese of Quebec. So it was extensive. But anyway, Rosati had within his diocese the Religious of the Sacred Heart, the Sisters of Loretta from Kentucky, who were one of the first US-born uh, groups with no connection to a European re religious congregation, and the Sisters or Daughters of Charity. Rosati, needing desperately in need for help, had touch with the Society for the Propagation of the Faith, which was centered in Lyon. And he chose Father Charles Choleton as his vicar to speak on his behalf in Lyon. Now this Father Choleton was the nephew of the Father Choleton who had started the Black Daughters or the Black Sisters in saint Etienne, which was the group that Mother St. John Fampan had taken over. The Countess Rochacolin began to write through Father Choleton to Bishop Rosati. She was determined to send missionaries to the United States and thought that it was Bishop Rosati who would most need them. As we have evidence 
Bishop Rosati said he wanted teachers for the deaf. There had been no epidemic that caused a lot of deafness. Uh, when the sisters first arrived in 1837, they had to go as far as St. Genevieve, about 90 miles away, to find their first deaf student. The possibility is that through the people who founded Gallaudet University, which was for the, the Gallaudet School to begin with, which was for the deaf, the people who founded that, although they got the help of a priest in Paris who had really uh, been the pioneer of deaf education, that was a Protestant school. And deaf education would have been very important for the Protestants because they were the people of the word. And you needed to know the word to be saved. And so what would you do with a deaf person? For the Catholics, it was a little simpler. You baptized them. But if the Protestants were beginning to teach deaf children, then the Catholics had better do it, or they would lose their deaf population to Protestantism. That's the best guess I can make at this point about why Bishop Rosati wanted deaf educators. So that we've got the setup. On our next slide, we'll see somebody well known to most of us. Mother St. John Fontbonne. Now, Mother St. John Fontbonne became a sister of St. Joseph in 1778 in Monistrol, which was very close to her home in Basse-en-Basse. After the revolution and everything we know happened there, in 1808, she went to St. Etienne at the request of Cardinal Fesch and Father Choleton who had started this group of sisters. She began a community there, and by 1814, they had grown to the point that it made sense to have their mother house in Lyon. And so they went to Lyon, and she is, of course, the one who sent missionaries to St. Louis in 1836. So now our next slide will show us the mother house that Mother St. John Fontbonne built in Lyon. Uh, we see here, it's a little hard, fuzzy, but we've got a sister of St. Joseph, somebody who looks like a postulant, and a visitor in a different style habit. She's not identified in the picture. If we'll go to the next slide. Mother St. John Fontbonne may not have ever had any plans to send missionaries to America. She was being besieged by requests from France. Sisters were needed, wanted everywhere that they could be. But she was a woman of prayer. Uh, it is said that every day she walked down to the chapel at Fouvier to pray privately before community's morning prayer. So she was a discerning woman. And some of the pieces of discernment that had to come together were her friend, the Countess's desire to send missionaries to America, the involvement of Father Choleton, uh, the Society for the Propagation of the Faith, which was encouraging missionary fervor. And so, with the invitation of Father Choleton on behalf of Bishop Rosati, she opened the community to the possibility of being missioners in the United States. She called for sisters to volunteer. They say a very large number volunteered. When it came time to choose those who would be sent, Mother St. John, they say, absented herself from the council meeting so that she would not influence the decision. And as many of us know, among those first volunteers, were two of her own nieces, Delphine and Fabroni. In the end, eight women were chosen to be the first missionaries to the United States. Six of them took off, while two of them were sent back to Saint Etienne, where they were to study techniques for teaching the deaf. And so we see the next slide, we get an idea of the lovely conveyance that our sisters had. We don't really have a picture of their ship, but this is a likely replica. Over here, 
which we will see on the next slide much better, uh, is the, the list of the passengers, at least that section of it, where we see our friends. Uh, imagine these young women, and the oldest was about 32, we'll see that in a minute, going off from Lyon to La Havre. We, I said, we don't know much about the ship. They didn't either. They were landlocked people. How far had they ever traveled before? Maybe as far as Le Puy, but certainly not that long trip to Paris and beyond to get to the ocean. What we can be pretty sure of is that they were on fire with missionary dreams and ready for what uh, their chronicler sister, St. Protis, said, ah, it's just a little ride we're going on. So on the next slide, we get the manifest of the passengers, where we see uh, Jacques Fanfan, uh, born in France, headed to St. Louis. His profession is a priest. And the rest of them listed down here, with their ages, some of which we can read, Jacques was 33, Marguerite Fontban, uh, who was Fabroni, 30, uh, her sister Delphine, 23, Fabroni Chapillon, 25, and so on down the list, 26, 24, 21. Uh, what the, this showed was their place of embarkation and their destination, St. Louis, which was a little further than that boat was going to go. So in our next slide, we see who these sisters were, at least in as much as we can know about them. Delphine Fontban, uh, Fabroni Fontban, and Fabroni Chapillon. Now I'm told that having this picture of the two Fabronis together is a very unusual thing because for the most part we see there's only one sister pictured in each photograph. But the first six to come were the two Fabronis, Delphine, Felicité, Sister Saint Protes, and Sister Philomène. We don't have a picture of Sister Philomène. Why, we don't know. Perhaps one theory is that she was a lay sister. On the other hand, when she got to the United States, she had some rather important positions as superior of houses or a teacher. Therefore, perhaps the reason for not having her photo is that she left France right after making vows and probably didn't have time to sit for the photographer before they took off. The last two to arrive were Sister Celestine Pomerel and Mother St. John Fournier. Uh, once again, these, the first sisters arrived uh, at St. Louis on March 25th, 1836. And that's when they were received at the uh, place where the old cathedral now stands. And they were received by the Sisters of Charity who lived in the city. The sisters, those Sisters of Charity also had an orphanage out south of the city that they were soon to abandon, not, not the orphans, but the house, because a wealthy St. Louis person was building them a new house. That house happened to be in the town of Carondelet, where the Sisters of St. Joseph would receive what the Sisters of Charity had left. In May of 1837, these two sisters left France and word was sent to the United States that they had left. Nothing more was heard. They really began to fear that they had been lost at sea. But they arrived at St. Louis, and the story goes that when they got to, the, to St. Louis and presented themselves to the bishop, now they were dressed as widows because uh, it wasn't all that safe to travel as Catholic nuns in this Protestant country. Even, even in uh, New Orleans, which was such a French heritage and Catholic city, 
there in New Orleans, the Ursulines had told the sisters, do not go on the street in your habit. So when they left New Orleans, any of them, and traveled up the river, they dressed as widows. But the rumor is that when they arrived, uh, Bishop Rosati wasn't sure that they were who they claimed to be, and so asked them if they would say something in sign language to one another. One said something to the other, and they both laughed. And apparently, what the communication was all about was how much they missed the good bread of France. America just didn't quite make it in terms of that bread. Now, if we'll see the next slide, we get kind of an idea of the costume that they may have well worn. This is widow's clothing of the 1860s. So it, it really isn't a lot more dressed up, and certainly not much more revealing than a habit would have been. Uh, but the dress and the bonnet, we'll hear from various communities about the sisters going out in their bonnets. Interestingly, if we think about it, dressing like this was very much in keeping with the sisters' origins, because in the days of Father Madai, instead of wearing a habit, they went out in the dress of widows because that was the way they could be easily among the people on the streets, meeting people that they would uh, be able to serve and serve with. But the United States, Protestant and prejudiced, could find in religious women an excellent target, a very obvious target for their anti-Catholicism. So now, with the next slide, we're going to start taking a little bit of a look at the Diocese of St. Louis. This is that old, what we call the old cathedral that Bishop Rosati had completed shortly before the sisters came. The Diocese of St. Louis was established in 1826. Rosati was a good administrator and a very ambitious one. His projects included the buildings of schools, seminaries, parishes. Uh, well, he, he encouraged schools, particularly in the outlying regions of the city. In the 1836 Catholic Directory, one of those early versions of the book, uh, it was listed that Rosati, Father Borgna, and Father Lutz were the permanent priests living in the city the sea city of the diocese. The cathedral offered a 10 o'clock mass where by the week the sermon would alternate between being in French or in German. And then the 9 o'clock mass had a German, had, I mean between French and English. And the 9 o'clock mass was always in German. Or the homily because of course the mass was in Latin. Uh, at that time, there were 16 parishes in the diocese, uh, nine of them in Illinois, three of them in Oklahoma. Uh, some were listed as being visited occasionally, uh, but it wasn't enough that they could list when they offered a liturgy. When the sisters came, they stayed with the Sisters of Charity. And they didn't stay long because the first, their first mission was across the river into what would now be the state of Illinois. And that we'll see in the next slide. Cahokia, the sisters' first mission in the United States. I think there might be a title with that too. But the chapel at Cahokia was founded in 1699. Uh, this church was newer. It was built in 1799 to replace the original one which had been destroyed by a fire. In that little village of Cahokia, the population was made up primarily of French trappers and their families, people who had settled in the area, who had an appreciation for the sisters and the education that they could offer, who spoke the same language as the sisters did. In a way, it was a very easy place to be. The first sisters to go there were the two Fabronis and Sister St. Protes. It really was a wonderful place, except for the fact that the river continued to flood and bring disease to the area. So on our next slide, we'll see the first permanent home.
of the Sisters of St. Joseph in the United States. They moved into Crondelet, the cabin at Crondelet, on September 12th of 1836. Uh, apparently, the Sisters of Charity left this little cabin with their orphans on July 22nd of 1836. Uh, and the sisters came a couple of months later where immediately they opened a convent school with 20 students. That, well, it wasn't immediately. They came on the 12th and they didn't open in school until the 19th. Uh, by October, they had two half-orphan girls. Half-orphan was a common designation in those days for someone, for a child who had one parent who was deceased. Most often, that was probably the mother who had died, and the father didn't have a way to take care of a couple of little children while also making a living. So by October, they had orphans in the house, two of them, and two weeks later, they got two more. So there's where we began at, in the United States at Carondelet. On the next slide, we'll get an idea that stuff wasn't all that easy. We had a situation, the people of Crondelet were more uh, wood gatherers, forest people, people who cut wood to sell in the city. Um, they were rough and tumble people described by one of the sisters as so poor that they didn't even have time to think about religion. The river, particularly on the Illinois side, was a problem as it flooded and caused disease, and at one point the sisters had to be rescued in a boat by Father John Fonfon and some others from their second story window over there at Cahokia. Another problem was Father Jacques Fonfon. We really don't know an awful lot about him, except that he moved around a fair amount. Uh, he, was, he came with the sisters and was their ecclesiastical superior to begin with. Got in quick conflict with the priest who was the pastor at the Crondelet area. And the two of them didn't see exactly eye to eye about how the sisters should be living. Jacques Fontbonne preferred to be in the city of St. Louis where the bishop was. Uh, Jacques Fontbon, though, remained the, for a while the superior of the sisters. He seemed to be much closer to his sister Delphine, the younger of the two, than to his sister Fabroni. Uh, his, his correspondence indicates that he thought Fabroni was just a little bit too lax in the way she was running things over there at Cahokia. The two Fontbon sisters were the first named superiors of the two communities in the United States. So Fabroni over in Cahokia seemed to be running too loose a ship. And according to the pastor at uh, Crondelet, Sister Delphine ran far too tight a ship. Um, but that's the way they began in under the tutelage of Father Feinbein. So Delphine tended toward rigidity. You can imagine what it was like for these French missionaries. Now, France in 1836 wasn't exactly the 21st century, but at the same time, we saw that beautiful mother house that they came from. They had the, as good a life as the typical French person had at that time. They were now on the frontier in a place where they didn't speak the language, in a place where they didn't have the, the ways to protect themselves from the weather, around people that they had never met before, far from home, far from all of their customs, for many reasons, not just the river, and also the cold, and also just the adjustment there was a lot of sickness, and they had to deal with a lot of poverty. So in the next slide, we'll see the arrival of the other two sisters. Celestine, 
with Sister Celestine Pomerel and Sister St. John Fournier, arrived on the 9th of September, 1837, months after they were expected. Uh, this is from Mother St. John Fournier's letter, talking about their trip. She says, when they arrived, the bishop told us he didn't want us to lose our rosy cheeks. He didn't tell us the real reason that he was keeping us in St. Louis. The poor house at Carondelet was too small. He was having it raised one story, and there was no roof. But the weather was good, she says. Then when they got out to Carondelet, she said, they brought us some mattresses, and we stretched out on the floor. Uh, well, before, this, before she got the mattresses, there was a pretty big rainstorm. They got absolutely sopped, so they ran to another place. Uh, stretched out on the floor. We tried to let, take a little rest in our wet habits, she said. But alas, now this is a place that we're going to be for two weeks. Who could sleep with rats, mice, and numberless little insects, not only as companions, but walking over us all night and for 10 or 12 nights in succession? The house was finally covered with a roof and we left our famished companions to feed themselves as best they could. And then she says the following week, the bishop brought us a little deaf-mute girl. Now there's an interesting story about this little deaf-mute girl that I said earlier, they had to go a fair distance from St. Louis to find this child who was in need of deaf education. But she was deaf-mute. They didn't know who she was, really. She had no, nobody gave her a name. And so they called her Potosi, which was the name of the town that she had come from. If we'll go to the next slide. Uh, it says, a few weeks after we arrived, Mother Delphine received our first postulant. So, 1837, it's not much more than a year that they've been on the property before somebody comes to join them. This was Miss Dillon, who became Sister Mary Frances Joseph. She belonged, she says, to one of the richest families in St. Louis, but she was happy to share our poverty. Mary Frances Dillon uh, was the daughter of a wealthy Irish landowner. Her mother had died when she was a child, and she and her sister went to the Academy of the Ladies of the Sacred Heart. And it was there that she met the Sisters of St. Joseph, who were studying their English with the Sisters of the Sacred Heart. Uh, we talked a little bit about Mother Delphine's strictness. Well, Sister Frances Joseph, or Eliza Dillon, was, wrote to the bishop about how strict Mother Delphine really was. Talked about the fact that she was expected to do just about everything. All of the things that a French postulant would normally do, in terms of cleaning and helping and serving the sisters and so on, but also she, Mother Delphine told her she had the privilege of teaching English. Now, of course, she was the only one there capable of teaching English, but that was her privilege. She, she complained to the bishop that she was being overworked and that it wasn't for this that she had entered religious life. We don't know whether the bishop answered her or not, but her complaints kind of bore out as uh, she died pretty quickly after making vows. We'll see about her and the other uh, first members of the community on this next slide. Eliza Dillon was born in 1820, so she was 17 when she entered the community. Uh, she was received, it says, our records say she was received in 1840. Now Mother St. Uh, John Fournier's letter said that she had come to Carondelet a few months after those sisters arrived in 1837. So she probably spent some time before she received the habit of the sisters. And then within a few months, two months, 
made vows. So not everything was going according to what we would call a 21st century initial formation plan. But by October 30th of 1842, Eliza Dillon died of consumption. That was what got most of the young sisters of those days who died. It was a factor of infection, cold, uh, and probably something having to do with poor nutrition. We see other sisters entering pretty quickly after that. Uh, Elizabeth Marsteller, whose name became Sister Mary Rose, she was, she was a little older. Born in 1810, received, interestingly, at the age of 32, uh, she made vows in 1844, and she lived 40 more years. So she was 74 by the time she died. Maria Kincaid, who became Sister Maria Antoinette, also from St. Louis, entered at the age of 20, made vows two years later, now that makes more sense, uh, and died in 1848. So life, life was obviously pretty tough as the sisters were beginning. Now, what were they doing? Our next slide will talk about their ministries. The first ministry, of course, as we said, was the school, the academy at Cahokia, where they started with three sisters. Before too long, Sister uh, St. Protes was sick enough that she had to come over to the St. Louis side of the river to recover. Someone else was sent to take her place for a while. There was great ebb and flow, visiting and trading off between the two communities. Uh, at the Carondelet side, there was a school which became a public school, meaning that it was paid for by the area, by, the, by tax money, as soon as 1838. And the sisters earned $375 a year. Now that's a pretty significant salary. Uh, if we look at the, the life of the times, in those days, days, eggs cost three for a penny. Butter was six cents a pound. And the sisters, to help them, also had a pear orchard with six trees dedicated to each one of the first six missionaries. And those apparently bore fruit very well until they were destroyed in a storm in 1889. So they had the school. The school quickly became an orphanage. So that little cabin was not only serving on the ground floor as the school, where the first day the sisters told the children that they had to bring something for themselves to sit on. Now, not many of them had child-sized chairs. Most of them apparently brought a log. Uh, it was the school, it was the orphanage, where the sisters shared the, the living space with the children. By the time uh, Sister Delphine and Sister Celestine, uh, Sister, excuse me, Sister Celestine and Sister St. John Fournier arrived, it was a school for the deaf that became a state school for the deaf in 1847. By 1840, they had built an additional building and boarders were received, and they were also doing parish ministries. Another very interesting piece of their ministry was a school for liberated Negroes that they opened in the year 1845. I'll read you from Mother St. John Fournier's letter about that, but before we get there, the next mission they opened was St. Vincent de Paul School. This was outside of Crandolet. In the beginning, they were just in the convent at Cahokia and Crandolet. Then as more people entered, more women entered, they could open more missions. The School for Liberated Negroes, St. Vincent de Paul School, uh, and in 1846 they would take over the uh, orphanage from the Sisters of Charity. This was going to be another frequent story among Sisters of St. Joseph in the United States. The Sisters of Charity 
various communities in the U.S. before they affiliated with the Daughters of Charity from France did many of the same things that Sisters of St. Joseph did. Once they affiliated with France, it became contrary to their rule to be able to take care of boys or teach boy students over a certain age. Sisters of St. Joseph were free to do that, and so we got much of what the Sisters of Charity could no longer do. But now to the next slide, we'll hear some of what Sister St. John Fournier said about this first school, which was sponsored by a Father Paris from the Diocese of St. Louis. Sister St. John Fournier wrote a letter back to Lyon in the 1870s, I believe it was, to tell Lyon all about what they had done, what she had been a part of in the United States. So in this letter she writes, in the year 1843 or 44, the first mission was opened in St. Louis as a school for liberated Negroes. By the first mission, she means that's the first place outside of those original two convents. The first mission of the Sisters of St. Joseph in the city of St. Louis. And of course we're using her language the typical language of the 1860s, 70s. Obedience sent me there with two other sisters. Now interesting, this priest had the idea of a school for children of African descent, free children. But she says, we also prepared slaves for the reception of the sacraments. And all of this displeased the whites very much. I wonder, if those sisters teaching children, preparing them for the sacraments, might not have found it necessary to help them learn to read. Because, you know, that's kind of necessary if you're going to follow the, the liturgy or know the scriptures at all. That was, of course, against the law at the time. The sisters displeased the whites very much. After some time, they threatened to have us put out by force. The threats were repeated every day. Now, we've got to think about this for a minute. We had maybe a couple of young women, at least one from St. Louis, who had grown up in this atmosphere, who knew what it was like to live in a society where there were slaves and free, where there were Af people of African descent who were slave and others who were free. We also had these French who were seeing people of African descent for the first time in their lives, and who had never known in their society anything like slavery. All of these are together in this school. So Sister St. John Fournier, who was the superior at the place, says, finally one morning as I was leaving church, several people called out to me and told me they were coming that night to put us out of the house. I said nothing to the sisters, and I was not afraid. So great confidence had I in the Blessed Virgin. I put some miraculous medals on the entrance gate and on the fences. We already had them on the doors and the windows of the house. At 11 o'clock, the sisters woke with a start when they heard a loud noise. Out in the street was a crowd of people crying out and cursing. We recited the Memorare and other prayers. Suddenly the police came and scattered those villains who were trying to break open the door. Now, this next slide will give us a sense of some of the attitude of the people of the time. This was an 1860s poster advertising the danger of encouraging laziness in people of African descent by educating them. You know, uh, it's a waste of time to try to teach the freed slaves is the idea. On the next slide, we will continue with Mother St. John Fournier's adventure that night. She says they returned several times that same night, 
but our good mother protected us and they were not able to open the door from the outside or to break it down. In the school, she said, we had about 80 children, it's three teachers, one of whom probably had to cook as well, all good and well-behaved. There were about 20 little boys. Now maybe it was well-behaved because the boys were so outnumbered. And they were already making fine progress. I believe we had been there about a year and a half or two years, she says. Then I scarcely remember any dates, but they must be at Crandallet. Unfortunately, a lot of those dates and a lot of that information is not at Crandallet. And it could well have been destroyed in a fire that happened in, uh, when the 18, after, 1850, after about 1860. So she says, the day after our adventure, the mayor of St. Louis came to Bishop Kenrick and advised him to close the school for a time, and he did. And she goes on to say, it was at about this time that the superiors of the Sisters of Charity withdrew their sisters from the boys' asylum. So the bishop asked dear mother Celestine to send us to, the, to Third Street to the orphan asylum. Now this, maybe we're running into one of her favorite vocabulary words, but she will say, there we found 75 little boys covered with vermin. They had, had no discipline in six months, having had only one sister at the asylum, the asylum, who relied too much on the servants. Well, you can understand that the sister had to rely on the servants because by then she was not allowed to care for boys. The skin diseases and vermin disappeared, and what is better still, the children became well behaved. So those are the beginnings of what the sisters were doing in the area of St. Louis, really probably within a 20 mile radius. So what are they going to do next? One of the most uh, unexpected, non-intuitive things you can imagine. The next slide will tell us that they go to Philadelphia. Now why Philadelphia? Why do sisters on the frontier in St. Louis go to the east to begin a mission in Philadelphia? It has to do with these two guys. Bishop Kenrick, Peter Richard, had become Bishop of St. Louis at the death of Monsignor Bishop Rosati. Rosati had been asked by the Pope to help deal with some diplomatic problems with Haiti. And he went to Rome, he traveled to Haiti, he went back to Rome, had pretty well taken care of the situation, but the travel had undone him. And he became very ill and stayed in Rome to die among his Vincentian brothers. While he had been in Rome, he had been looking for an assistant, a coadjutor bishop. And the first one he wanted was Bishop John Timon, or he wanted John Timon to be his bishop. Timon was another Vincentian. Happens to be one of the priests who was with Rosati in New Orleans when the Sisters of St. Joseph first arrived in 1836. Timon had known the Sisters since that time. But Timon, who was known to be a great missionary, had no interest at that time in being a bishop. And that time and a few other times, he refused the appointment to be a bishop. So while Rosati had been in Rome, he saw Peter Richard Kenrick, who was younger brother to Francis Patrick Kenrick, who was Bishop of Philadelphia. Kenrick had come from Ireland to work in the diocese of his brother, who was a bishop, and had become pretty well known as an eloquent theologian. He had been at councils of Baltimore, but Peter Richard Kenrick had decided he wanted to be a Jesuit. He didn't try to enter the Jesuits in England because apparently his brother wrote two glowing 
a recommendation letter for him and he was embarrassed about it. So he went to Rome to try to enter the Jesuits and the Jesuit provincial turned him down for reasons we do not know. This is when Bishop Rosati meets him and talks the Pope into making him the coadjutor bishop. By the time Peter Richard Kenrick gets back to the US and is ordained a bishop to be Rosati's coadjutor, he travels out to St. Louis to get the word that Bishop Rosati has died in Rome. So he becomes bishop and he becomes a very good friend and support of the Sisters of St. Joseph. So when his brother Francis Patrick comes out to visit him, he hears about the good work of the Sisters of St. Joseph. And the story is that Bishop Kenrick of Philadelphia so wanted the Sisters of St. Joseph that he went to Mother Celestine, who had by this time taken over from Sister Delphine as the, the local superior, and he was asking Celestine for uh, sisters to come to Philadelphia. She said she'd have a council meeting about it. He decided that it might help if he would come out and spend the night at Crandolet before the council meeting so that he'd be there for breakfast with the sisters and able to plead his cause. Well, in the end, sisters were chosen to go to Philadelphia. So we'll see in this next slide one of, one of our really outstanding Sisters of St. Joseph, Mother St. John Fournier. A little bit about her life. She was born in 1814, uh, went away from home to enter a religious community, the community of the Immaculate Conception. Now that was a cloistered community. That's where she had her formation, that's where she made vows in 1832. Somehow, she, a member of the community of the Immaculate Conception in Lyon, maybe through contact with the Countess Rochacolin, maybe somehow else, perhaps through her cousin, who was Celestine Pomerel, learns that the Sisters of St. Joseph are considering a mission to America and she wants to be a missionary. And so she turns to Mother St. John Fontan and enters the community of the Sisters of St. Joseph and received the habit in June of 1836. Very shortly thereafter, she and her cousin, who some stories say she was raised with, were sent to St. Etienne to study deaf education. Their education there, for sure, was sponsored by the Countess Rochacolin. Mother St. John Fournier came to America as a novice of the Sisters of St. Joseph. You know, in, uh, up until recently, after the law of uh, 1917, that would not have been allowed because officially she was taking a step down by leaving a cloistered community to enter an apostolic community. But that's what she wanted to do, and she arrived in the United States as a novice, and apparently a novice with less than perfect health. It took her a long time to get Bishop Rosati to accept her for vows. Now, I'm not sure exactly what Rosati would have done with her if he hadn't accepted her for vows. I guess maybe send her back to France. But she made vows December 27, 1838. And after her being at Crandolet, being a deaf teacher, being the, one of the sisters who founded the school for the liberated blacks, she founded the community in Philadelphia in 1847. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, Mother St. John Fournier travels to Philadelphia with sisters Mary Joseph Clark, Elizabeth Kincaid, and Mary Magdalene Weber. Now, Mary Joseph and Magdalene Weber, had, Mary Joseph and Sister Elizabeth, excuse me, had just made first vows when they went with Mother St. John Fournier. Of course, first vows were final vows in those days. They had just made vows, better said. 
Uh, Magdalene Weber is someone about whom we are going to hear more as our history goes on. She was from Pennsylvania, and risking saying this, not being a Pennsylvania, she was from the town of Conewago, uh, about 80 miles west of Philadelphia. How did she hear about the Sisters of St. Joseph? Good question. But we got a number of vocations from the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, so these are the four who found Philadelphia. And again, we'll hear from Mother St. John Fournier's letter with the next slide. She says, on the 6th of May, 1847, after repeated requests from the Bishop of Philadelphia, Francis Patrick Kenrick of Happy Memory, four sisters arrived in Philadelphia to take charge of the orphanage, which for two years had been entrusted to ladies and servants who received their salaries and took little care of the orphans, so that we found them covered with vermin and in rags. We had to get in, to work immediately and with courage, even though we were quite disgusted. There were then only 75 children. Now, and she's writing this letter in 1873, now we have 400. So these four missionaries uh, from St. Louis to Philadelphia only took on 75 children covered with vermin and rags the, days that, the day that they arrived. There were then only two houses of Sisters of Charity and ourselves in Philadelphia. Now there are 11 different orders in the city. In the month of June, after our arrival, Bishop Kenrick asked, us, asked me to receive several good subjects. Her letter goes on on the next slide. All right. Now we know that the sisters arrived in Philadelphia on May 6th of 1847. Mother St. John Fournier continues her letter saying, in the month of June, right after our arrival, Bishop Kenrick asked me to receive several good subjects. They've got all these vermin-covered kids, and now they're supposed to take in postulates. Quite against my will, she says, we received four who were soon so busy with the children, as busy with the children as we. Soon they said everywhere, even the priests, that our postulants were eating the orphans' bread. At first we did not receive any salary. Then we kept our own money separate, which was not very easy. With the postulants' money, we bought all the necessities of life for the postulants. I explained everything to Bishop Kenrick, who told me not to pay any attention to that nonsense. Now, it wasn't very many years before this that there had been anti-Catholic riots in the city of Philadelphia, that just outside of Philadelphia, in Charleston, an Ursuline convent had been burned down. People are complaining about the sisters, accusing them of taking the orphans' food, and Kenrick says, don't pay any attention to that nonsense. Of course, now Mother St. John Fournier had already been through the riots in St. Louis, so maybe she was able to do that. On the next slide, we'll see how things went. <clears throat> Uh, their first receptions and ministries in Philadelphia. October 20th, 1847, Eliza Jane Carroll enters the community, who becomes Sister Jane Frances de Chantal, followed by, together with, Josephine McMahon, who becomes Sister Josephine, somehow was able to keep her own name. December 27th, 1847. Now see these, remember these two entered they were part of the group that came uh, in June. So they received the habit in October. Two more received the habit in December. Mary Myrie, who became Sister Apollonia, and Mary Margaret Lovett, who became Sister Salome. 
The sisters began in uh, Philadelphia with St. John's Orphan Asylum in 1847. The next year, three of them opened up St. Patrick's School in Pottsville. The next year, five of them took over St. Joseph's Hospital. This was a new hospital in Philadelphia that the Sisters of St. Joseph began. And then finances caused a change of administration. And the Sisters basically lost it in 1859. But St. Joseph's Hospital in Philadelphia would have been the first healthcare institution of the Sisters of St. Joseph in the United States. In 1850, they opened St. Anne's Widow's Asylum, which was for the elderly, women over 40. In 1851, three of them were involved in opening St. Joseph's School. In 1852, St. Philip's School. The community was growing. The community was serving, spreading very quickly. And more of their history will be seen at a later date. But we do need to remember that at this time, Philadelphia, the sisters had been missioned to Philadelphia by Mother Celestine. Mother St. John Fournier was the local superior. The two communities, the two areas, were in great contact. Sisters came and went between St. Louis and Philadelphia, even though Philadelphia was quickly doing its own formation program. The next place that we will open, and we'll do some of this in this section, and we'll pick up again here in the next presentation, is 1851, St. Paul, Minnesota. Now, when we get to St. Paul, we've got another old friend that the sisters are dealing with. Joseph Creighton, who looked much better as a young man than he did as an older one, uh, born in 1799, died in 1857. He was born near Geneva, which meant that he was from broadly the same part of France as many sisters of St. Joseph. He was a very successful young priest. Um, and he, he preached in the area, he, he served in the area of Voltaire. When Bishop Loras, newly named, another Frenchman, newly named as Bishop of Dubuque, returned to France to try to recruit help, he came to Cretan, or probably said Cretan in that time, and asked him to come. Cretan was so popular that they say he pretty much escaped in the night, left secretly so that people wouldn't try to keep him back, neither his parishioners nor his family, and accompanied Bishop Loras to the United States in 1838. Now, when these two were headed for Dubuque, they came through St. Louis, probably the same kind of route that our sisters took from France to New Orleans and then up the river. By the time they got as far as St. Louis, the Mississippi was frozen over. And they had to spend the winter, they had, until the, the river, the ice went away, they had to stay around St. Louis. So they happened to stay in the area of Crondelet. They, they stayed in a little cabin on the grounds of Crondelet. And word has it that Loris even helped out in the kitchen and shared uh, his recipes with one of the sister cooks. But these two gave retreats to the sisters. They knew the sisters pretty well. So that by the time Cretan is named Bishop of St. Paul in 1850, he knows that he can turn to the sisters of St. Joseph for help. He actually had turned to others already and been turned down. But probably that relationship with the sisters of St. Joseph made it a little too difficult for our mother Celestine Pomerel to say no. So on the next slide, we'll just see the beginnings of this, and that'll be where we stop and pick up the next time. August of 1851. 
Mother St. John Fournier in Philadelphia is worn out. She spent four years with that founding, with formation programs, with taking care of the orphans, starting a hospital. Thank you with what nurses training? You know, this is, this is somebody who's prepared to teach the deaf and she's taking over all of this. She was worn out. So the doctor says, go back to St. Louis and rest a bit. She gets back to St. Louis, hears her cousin, Mother Celestine, saying that she's got to go up to St. Paul to begin a community. And Fournier sees that she is, that Celestine is in bad, as bad a shape as she is and says, I'll go. So Mother St. John Fournier goes with Sister Philomène Villain, one of the first of the French sisters to come over. Sister Frances Joseph Ivory, who becomes one of our great chroniclers and also has adventures in multiple new foundations. And Sister Scholastica Vasquez, of whom we will hear later as the Sisters of St. Joseph, first real missionary to Native Americans. So Mother St. John Fournier and Villain are both from France. Scholastica Vasquez is a Creole, which probably means she's got French and Spanish background. Francis Joseph Ivory is a native of Loretto, Pennsylvania. Uh, so here we have this original community of St. Paul. And that's what Mother St. John, or, or, excuse me, Sister Frances Joseph Ivory says, all of whom have gone to the reward, but the last named individual who's under a heavy cross, yet willingly and cheerful, may God be praised. That's Sister Frances Joseph Ivory, whose chronicles we will hear. The next slide shows us that cathedral that the bishop abandoned so that the sisters could have it as their first home, the cathedral on the bluff. And as we look at the final slide here, we'll see the appearance of various ones of our ancestors, some of whom we've met today, and some of whom we'll meet in the next chapter. But these are the women who began this great adventure in the United States of America, starting in 1836. Thank you. Until the next time.